building is ours. One way out! One way out! Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. This will be my full Star Wars and or episode 10 video. There's a whole bunch of Easter eggs and references. We'll break it all down. It was probably one of the best episodes of the series so far. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the episodes and careful for spoilers if you haven't seen the episode yet. We'll just start at the beginning and work our way through shot by shot talking about Easter eggs and WTF moments. Starting with the episode title, it was called One Way Out, which is a reference to their big prison break because there's only one way out of the Imperial prison. And that's why Kino Loy kept repeating that line of dialogue, One Way Out. It's also meant to be a reference to Luthen's speech at the end of the episode, like it's meant to be a parallel for that when he's talking about what he sacrificed for the rebellion with Lonnie, the ISB officer. In the context of Luthen's speech, it's meant to be the one way out is death. Like he's saying he sacrificed everything. He's basically trying to say that there's no way out. He's trapped, just like Lonnie is trapped. You can't leave us. We've invested too much time in you. When Luthen references his equation from 15 years ago, that 15 years puts it right during the middle of Revenge of the Sith. When the Emperor was creating the Empire, Order 66 was going down. He realized that he wasn't going to get out of this alive, like he's going to die. And if you think about it, he's not mentioned at all in the canon during the events of Rogue One or later in the timeline. I think the reason for that early theory is because he does wind up dying while creating the rebellion. Like he will be successful, like the rebellion will come together formally as a large fighting force, but he will die in the process. So it's sort of like a rallying cry for the prison break, like it's a really happy moment for them, like, yeah, we're getting out of here but also kind of a sad, tragic moment for Luthen, like, oh, we're getting out of here, but the only way we're getting out, one way out, is death. The actual opening scene is the guards at the prison in the med tech taking Olaf's body out, but taking it through the workroom so that all the other prisoners have to see it. They decide to make their big prison break, and even though it seems like it takes Kino Loy's character a little while to come around, like Andy Serkis's character eventually does tell them, very succinct, we're never getting out of here, you're all gonna die either on this level or when you get transferred to another one. So there is only one way out for us. Andy Serkis also did a couple interviews talking about his character's backstory because they don't give you a whole lot of details about his backstory in the actual series. He said that he kind of came up with one himself. He said that he used to be a merchant character who spoke out against the Empire and that's what got him thrown in prison the first time. Then while he was in prison, he sort of tucked his tail between his legs, thinking that doing everything that they asked that the Empire, the guards asked, would get him out quicker. Obviously, that not being the case. The other really interesting thing at the beginning of the episode here when they're first deciding like, oh yeah, we're definitely going to get out of here, is Andor questioning what the Empire is actually having them build at the prison there. Like, what are they actually having us make? And I think the best theory about that is that these parts are actually for the Death Star itself and they've been having him create the weapon that will eventually destroy him, that will kill him during Rogue One. I think that flows with the themes of the actual series, like they're basically using the people against themselves. That's why the Empire is so insidious. Then at the ISB, Dedra starts briefing them on the rebel heist that they're trying to pull on the rebel group because they want to catch them in the act, and they're trying to make it look like this rebel pilot died by accident. When she mentions the ship Kafreen Rescue Salvage, Kafreen is actually the base that Andor is at at the beginning of the Rogue One movie. The actual rebel group that they're trying to catch is led by Anto Krieger, the person that Luthen wanted Saw Gerrera to work with, meaning that if they would be successful, if he hadn't found out about it during the episode, they would have wound up catching Saw Gerrera's group as well. But obviously this is all meant to set up the big turn at the end of the episode when we find out what's going on with Lonnie's character. We briefly go back to Ferrix for a hot minute just to check in with Cinta who's been watching Andor's home waiting for him to show up. Gonna get there eventually but obviously we have to break out of prison first so just gonna be a hot second before he makes it back. But I think this is just meant to remind us that oh we are coming back to Ferrix before the end of the season. Like they'll end the season on Ferrix. We meet that pseudo crime boss Davos Skulden that Takeholma wanted Mon Mothma to borrow money from to hide her previous donations to the rebels. His whole story about visiting Coruscant 30 years ago would have put him there well before the events of Phantom Menace in the earlier, very early days of Palpatine's Senate run. He actually became senator in the days before Chancellor Valorum took over the Senate. When he joined the Senate, the Supreme Chancellor was named Skor Kalpana. It was actually his master, Darth Plagueis, who arranged for him to become the senator from Naboo. That position also gave him control over like 36 other worlds inside a single sector, so he had a lot of political power when he started out. And it was all part of this long-term Sith plan to slowly take over the galaxy. Darth Plagueis wanted to plant his apprentice inside the Senate and then have him slowly create connections, sow more dissent, just build his power base, then eventually do what you saw happen during the events of the prequels. You have to remember though, at a certain point, Palpatine wound up killing Darth Plagueis and becoming the Sith Master himself. So at a certain point, Plagueis' plan became Palpatine's plan. 
We also learn Davos is from Chandrila, originally like Mon Mothma and her husband, and Takeholma. His whole speech about being rich, not having to listen to others' opinions, is just to give you more of a vibe of his character. Like, he's meant to be as slimy as possible, feel just like the other people who would cozy up with Palpatine and just try to use power towards their own ends. They actually did a little bit of this during the Tales of the Jedi episodes, where you learn about a lot of corrupt senators during the events of the prequels, or before the events of the prequels, technically. The whole idea is that even before Palpatine came along, there was a lot of corruption in the Senate, which is why it was so easy for him to take over the Senate. If you remember, Mon Mothma's big concern in this, at least before their conversation, was that she'd be blackmailed for political favors, and turns out that was the least of her problems. He wants his son to become engaged to Mon Mothma's daughter, because, according to their customs, they can get married when they're 15, and they're almost 15. Even though she flat out tells him no as he leaves, I think the idea is that she does need the money to cover up her rebel transactions. But I think that's where Luthen comes in because he has this giant pile of money. And because right after this scene, we go straight to Luthen's shop. So they want you to be thinking about Luthen and Mon Mothma's association. I think they'll tie up that plot line by the end of the season. So we'll know for sure exactly how she's going to wrap that up. But like I said, I think it's going to have something to do with Luthen's rebel money that they stole from Aldani. One of the other interesting details during their conversation too is that you notice that Mon Mothma refuses to look him in the eye and she gets really pissed off when she finds out about her husband's association with him. Like, oh, I hang out with your husband all the time. Oh, I bet you do. They make it sound like she actually kind of hates her husband. And the way that Davo talks about Chandralin marriage customs and the separation between husband and wife makes it sound like they live really separate lives. And that's a regular thing in the history of their people. In the way that in medieval times, in real life, you'd have a lot of political marriages and husband and wife wouldn't actually be in love with each other. So oftentimes there'd be a lot of infidelity in the marriage and usually it was tolerated as long as it was kept off the radar, so to speak. Like when you start having scandals, public starts finding out about it, that's when people start getting stabbed and getting their heads chopped off. So he's just making it sound like Mon Mothma and her husband just don't know exactly what each other are doing during the day. When we go to Luthen's shop, it seems like they've only moved around a couple of the artifacts and Easter eggs. Behind him, these giant horns here seem like they're the same types of horns from Masa Maida's race. He's a Chagrigan, and the rounded helmet that he scans is the one that Padme wears during the prequels. The one next to it, I think we've all agreed, is a Wookiee battle helmet. I've already talked about a lot of the Easter eggs in the back of the shop too, like he has a duplicate Starkiller armor. The giant box on the right seems like a Jedi holocron, but it's really big for a Jedi holocron, usually they're a little bit smaller. If you remember a couple episodes ago too, on the left side, on this wall here, we actually saw an Indiana Jones Easter egg. These are the stones from Temple of Doom. In real life, Lucasfilm just announced that they're actually working on an Indiana Jones TV show for Disney+, Plus, but I don't know what it's going to be about or if it'll be like a continuation of the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles. Presumably, we'll see it in a couple years, so we'll find out pretty soon what it's about. Then we get our big prison break. This is one of my favorite parts of the episode. This and Luthen's scene at the end of the episode. Their first countermeasure to short out the floor security system that shocks the bulkheads is to just flood the floor. When they start attacking the guards and climbing out, they do show you that a couple of them do die in the process. Like, this isn't a completely bloodless escape. The minute they head up the stairs and they show you how far up it is just made me think of that scene from Avengers Endgame with the Hulk. The Hulk versus stairs. So many stairs. No! Inside the control room, before they take it over, the guard's next reactionary measure is to fry a bunch of the levels, like they fry that entire level before to keep the prisoners quiet. But this time with the prison break, they're like, okay, we'll shut down a bunch of the levels. When they do take over the control room, Andor repeats their orders back to the guards on program, and Kino Loy gives this big rousing escape speech, basically to tell them to get the hell out. One way out, repeating that line of dialogue, the title of the episode. I believe there was meant to be about 5,000 total prisoners in that particular prison. His whole speech is also meant to be a metaphor for the rebellion just in general. The whole idea that it's better that they die trying to escape rather than comply with the Empire. That's sort of the same idea with Luthen's character. Like, he is prepared to die. He knows he is going to die in the act of rebelling against the Empire. But that's better than doing nothing. Earlier this season, Andor also made a couple of references to the guards being relatively weak and poorly equipped. Most of the ones who aren't already dead are hiding behind this locked door waiting for everyone to escape before they come out. Just sort of paying that off like, oh yeah, they are pretty sucky guards. Kino Loy not being able to swim seems kind of like a tragic moment. Like they don't show you what winds up happening to him because you only see Andor and Melshi running away at the end of the episode. So you're like, what happened to the rest of the prisoners that escaped? Did they all die? Did some of them get away? 
I think they just want to leave you wondering what eventually happens to Andy Serkis's character. Like he could still be alive or he could have died in the attempt. He could have just drowned while they were trying to swim away. But I think part of the idea is that a number of these people who do escape will eventually wind up joining the rebellion. And just because they only show us Andor and his friend at the end of the episode doesn't mean that they're the only two that wound up escaping. But a bunch of these others swimming away probably did subsequently die during their attempt. And if you think it's weird that someone like Kino Loy wouldn't be able to swim, even in real life, like in first world countries, there are a lot of adults who still cannot swim, if you can believe it. Surprisingly, there are a lot of drowning deaths every single year around the world. Then probably the other biggest reveal of the episode is that Dedra's co-worker, her fellow supervisor, is part of the rebellion or has been an informant working with them from inside the belly of the beast, so to speak, the whole time. And just to be clear, he is meant to be the same rank as Dedra, so he has the same level of authority, just over a different part of the galaxy. He was the supervisor in the previous episode who alerted them to increased activity near Scarif, which is meant to be a reference to the events of Rogue One and the Death Star. Like activity is increasing towards that part of the system because of everything the ISB is doing trying to create the Death Star. The place where they go to meet is in Coruscant's lower levels where all the shady stuff, all the criminal activity gets done. Remember that Coruscant is a planet-wide city that's just built on top of older city. And as the city gets bigger, they just continue building on top of the previous city. Like all the wealthiest people live on the top and all the poor people live underneath. So you have thousands and thousands of years of city just built on top of older city. They explored some of this during the Clone Wars, like Ahsoka travels way, way down to the lower levels. They do a good job of visual storytelling during this too, with a lot of his actions, like he grabs for the comm knowing that it would be there without having to look for it, meaning that they've done this before, but Luthen says it's been about a year since they've actually met with each other. The way they explain their backstory is that he's been working with Luthen, helping the Rebellion, and they've kind of been informing each other, like Luthen feeds him information, which he uses to advance his rank inside the ISB for the past six years, and he's been tipping off Luthen, helping the Rebellion along the way. The whole thing with Luthen subtly threatening the life of his newborn daughter is also meant to let you know that he's not helping the rebels completely willingly and he's trying to continue to ensure his loyalty like oh by the way you have that daughter we want to do everything we can to make sure she has a wonderful life and a wonderful father. The whole idea with this is just to show you that the rebels do things that are just as shady and bad as the empire short of full blown genocide like they do with the Death Star later. Like as bad as the rebels are, and they are doing things that are really bad, especially Luthen, all this collateral damage that he's totally fine with, the Empire is still worse. The reason Luthen lies about their involvement in the heist on Aldani, like he denies that he was connected to it, I think is him hedging his bets in case Lonnie winds up being found out and interrogated by Dedra so that it doesn't wind up confirming her suspicions if he is caught. And that's also why he's willing to sacrifice Anto Krieger. Oh, it's only 50 men. They're worth it. We don't want to tip off the Empire, we want things to continue as usual. Also when Luthen says that he's doing all this for Lonnie, for him, it's just to psychologically manipulate him as an informant to keep him loyal to the cause, keeping him wrapped around his finger so to speak. Because I think if Lonnie had protested too much, Luthen would have killed him. Like they do a good job of foreshadowing all this stuff during their conversation. Luthen telling him about sacrifice and there being no way out for either of them. And it being kind of a parallel for Kino Loy's statement, one way out, but for them it's a tragic statement and it means that they'll both probably wind up dying in the cause. The one way out will be them dying. Luthen's whole speech here at the end of the episode, also probably one of my favorite speeches in all of Star Wars recently. We'll see if they top this during the Mandalorian season three. Like there's been a lot of great Mandalorian episodes, but I feel like Andor has really taken it next level with some of the character dynamics. And like I said, when he talks about the 15 years ago, the equation that he wrote, that's meant to be during the events of Revenge of the Sith, when that was all going down. When he also references sharing his hopes and dreams with ghosts, I think that's him saying in so many words that his loved ones died, like his family died, and that's one of the things that helped inspire him to create the rebellion. And we see Andor and the other future rebel, Melshi, continuing to escape on foot. And obviously, I think the reason why they showed us Ferrix briefly during the episode is to just let you know that Andor will come back to Ferrix. And that's where we're going to end the last couple of episodes. If there are any other Easter eggs and references that you spotted in the episode that I didn't talk about in the video, just write them below in the comments. And let me know, do you think that Kino Loy wound up surviving their escape attempt? My full episode 11 video will post next week after they release it. There's a bunch of stuff happening this week too. My Black Panther Wakanda Forever post credit scene video and full breakdown and Easter eggs for the entire movie will post later this week. Be sure to go see the movie as soon as possible. Everyone click here for my review of the movie and click here for my other post credit scene video. I'll update the link as soon as I post that video. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe and I'll see you guys in the next one.